so glad that you came to worship with us today. If you have your Bibles, turn with me to Galatians chapter 3. Galatians chapter 3. Going to talk about you have a family today. Galatians chapter 3. 3. Galatians 3. Going to begin reading in verse 7. You have a family. Paul says, consider Abraham. He believed God and it was credited to him as righteousness. Understand then that those who believe are the sons of Abraham. The scripture foresaw that God would justify the Gentiles by faith and announced the gospel in advance to Abraham, all nations will be blessed through you. So those who have faith are blessed along with Abraham, the man of faith. All who rely on observing the law are under a curse, for it is written, Cursed is everyone who does not continue to do everything written in the book of the law. Clearly no one is justified before God by the law, because the justified shall live by faith. The law is not based on faith. On the contrary, the man who does these things is bound to live by them. But Christ has redeemed us from the curse of the law. By becoming a curse for us, for it is written, Cursed is everyone who is hung on a tree. He redeemed us in order that the blessing that was given to Abraham might come to the Gentiles now through Christ Jesus, so that by faith we might receive the promise of the Spirit. Jump down to the very end of Galatians 3, the very last verse, Galatians 3.29. Let's round out our reading. Paul says, If you belong to Christ, then you are Abraham's seed and heirs according to the promise. Let's pray and ask the Holy Spirit to minister to us. Father, I thank you for your presence here. I thank you for the people you love so much. Father, I pray that we would encounter you now through the ministry of your word. If your heart agrees with that, would you just say amen, amen. and amen. Last week, we shared with you the good news that you have a father. Today, I wanna share the good news that you have a family. Right now, we're reading Paul's letter to the believers in the region of Galatia, that is now modern day Turkey. But this is no ordinary letter, it's a letter from heaven, inspired by the Holy Spirit to speak across the ages to you and to me. And we've come to that section of the letter where Paul is talking about several interwoven spiritual realities that come not through our religious effort, but come by faith. Faith is the doorway to God. Faith is the doorway to salvation. It's the means by which we lay hold of the grace of salvation. Faith is the doorway to the kingdom of heaven. It's the doorway to all the riches of God in Jesus Christ. Faith is the doorway to eternal life. When you have that moment of being convinced deep inside about Jesus, when you have that moment of surrendering your will, your life to him, a whole new world of spiritual experiences opens up to you. One experience that comes by faith is union with Christ. Shared about that a couple weeks ago now. I am in Christ and Christ is in me. Another experience that comes by faith is with the Holy Spirit. Shared about two experiences with the Holy Spirit. The indwelling Holy Spirit and the overflowing Holy Spirit. Another experience that comes by faith is adoption as sons of God. You have a father, Abba, and he's a good dad. How many of you have been praying this week using the word, the prayer word of Jesus, Abba? It was the prayer word of the early church, the way that Jesus addressed the father intimately, that expressed his connectedness, became the prayer word of the early church, and now it's ours too. I've been praying all week to Abba in the name of Jesus, and I want to tell you, it just does something for your prayer life. So let's talk about one more experience that comes by faith. You are now Abraham's seed. If you belong to Christ, then you are Abraham's seed and heirs according to the promise. So what does that mean to be Abraham's seed? Looking at Paul's words, I see two things that I want to share with you, and then I want to say a word about phase two, and then we're going to take a little stroll together outside. What does it mean to be Abraham's seed? Two things. First of all, 
To be Abraham's seed means that you belong to a blessed family. Paul says, understand then that those who believe are the children of Abraham. So those who have faith are blessed along with Abraham, the man of faith. If you belong to Christ, then you are Abraham's seed and heirs of the promise. Galatians 3 is a very complex tapestry of verses. But there are three words that are used synonymously, blessing and promise and inheritance. What was the blessing that God promised to Abraham under the stars one night that has now become our inheritance through Jesus Christ? The blessing of Abraham consists of three things that I want to share with you. First of all, the blessing of Abraham is justification by faith in Christ. Paul tells us in Galatians 3 that all people of all times are saved one and only way through faith in Christ. God made a promise to Abraham, through your seed, all the nations of the earth will be blessed. This was the promise that Abraham believed and God credited it to Abraham as righteousness. Although Abraham was a sinner, although he was an idol worshiper, although he was a liar, although he had all kinds of problems under his roof, God no longer regarded Abraham as a sinner nor counted his sins against him. God regarded Abraham as innocent by association. Shared about that three weeks ago. If you missed it, go listen to that sermon. But it's called justification. It is right standing with God. God now regards me just as if I'd never sinned. Justification is the blessing of Abraham. David said, blessed is the man whose sin does not count against him, whose sins are covered. Now, the reason that Abraham received this blessing of justification was because of his faith in Yeshua, Hamashiach, Jesus, the Messiah, Jesus Christ. You see, Abraham's faith was in more than just the promise of a biological son, Isaac. His faith specifically was in God's promise of a son who would be a savior. A son who would bring the same blessing of justification that he had experienced to all the nations of the earth. A son who would reconcile people to God and restore all the damage that sin has done. We didn't take the time to read the entire chapter of Galatians 3, but in the verses that we didn't read, Paul shows that Abraham's promised seed is Jesus. Jesus is the promised son of Abraham. In fact, Matthew's gospel introduces Jesus as the son of Abraham. Jesus is the promised son who has brought the blessing of Abraham to the Gentiles by bearing the curse of the law on our behalf on the cross. Christ has redeemed us from the curse of the law, becoming a curse for us. He redeemed us in order that the blessing that was given to Abraham might also come to the Gentiles through faith in Christ. You see, 2,000 years before Jesus came to earth, God preached the good news. God preached the gospel to Abraham in advance. Hebrews says that Abraham saw Jesus from afar. Jesus said, Abraham rejoiced to see my day. He saw it and he was glad. On trial before King Agrippa, Paul said, what? All I'm preaching is the promise that was made to our fathers beginning with Abraham. So whether Jews or Gentiles, whether B.C. or A.D., all people of all time are saved the one and only way through faith in Jesus Christ. Beginning with Abraham, the Jewish saints of the Old Testament looked ahead to the cross and they believed. And today we look back on the cross and we believe. We shared about union with Christ. When you believe on Jesus, you become united to him in a mystical bond of relationship. In a way that exceeds my ability to really explain to you, you become enfolded into Christ. 
And since Christ is the son of Abraham, you have also become a son of Abraham by association. That happens to you automatically when you receive Christ. It comes with the salvation package. You don't have to opt into being a son of Abraham, and you surely can't opt out of being a son of Abraham. And since you are a son of Abraham, you are now an heir to the blessing of Abraham. Justification. God no longer regards you as a sinner, nor counts your sins against you. How many of you know that is some good news? Oh, if you're going to do it, do it, or don't do it. Right along with justification, a second thing in the blessing. The blessing of Abraham is God's presence with you via the Holy Spirit. Paul says he redeemed us. So the blessing that was given to Abraham, that's justification, might come to the Gentiles through Jesus Christ so that by faith we might receive the promise of the Spirit. You see, the experience of the Holy Spirit, the indwelling Holy Spirit, the overflowing Holy Spirit is your own internal evidence that you have indeed received the blessing of Abraham and you've become a child, a son of Abraham. And when you have been justified, God is no longer against you, but God is for you. God said to Abraham, I will be God to you and to your descendants after you. The blessing of Abraham is that the king of the universe, the creator of everything, is now your God and God is with you. See, when God is your God, he works for you with all of his power. God said to Abraham, don't be afraid, Abraham. I will be your shield and your very great reward. When God is your God, he will help you. When God is your God, he will guide you. When God is your God, he will provide for you. When God is your God, he will protect you. When God is your God, he will cause you to prevail over your enemies, both earthly and spiritual. God said to Abraham, your children will possess the gates of their enemies. We will prevail over phase two. We will will possess that new building. When God is your God, he'll help your children too. He'll rescue your children. I will contend with those who contend with you and your children I will save. His blessings will fall on them too. He'll guide, he'll protect, he'll provide for them too. He'll bring your children good spouses. When Abraham's servant, Eliezer, found beautiful Rebekah for Isaac, he shouted out to God. He said, blessed be the Lord God of Abraham, who has not forsaken his steadfast love and faithfulness to my master. He'll bless your kids. He'll even bless them with a beautiful spouse and family. When God is your God, he will pursue you with goodness and mercy all the days of your life. And when God is your God, since he is eternal, he'll keep being your God even when your life on earth is over. This is good preaching right here. Even when you're done being you, God isn't done being your God. And so you keep right on being you in another place. The Pharisees came, the Sadducees, excuse me, came and challenged Jesus one day. The Sadducees didn't believe in the afterlife. They didn't believe in heaven. That's why they were so sad, you see? <laughs> Jesus said to them, haven't you read what God said to you? I am the God of Abraham. Not I was the God of Abraham. He is the God of the living and not the dead. What Jesus was saying is Abraham still is and God is still his God. Yeah. 
And if you are a son of Abraham through faith in Jesus Christ, even when people on earth say you was, nah, you still is, and God is still your God. How many of you think it might be a good thing to be a son of Abraham through faith in Jesus Christ? And there's a third thing in the blessing of Abraham. The blessing of Abraham is that you are now a member of the household of faith. You are now a member of the family of faith. Someone once said, don't shake your family tree too hard or all the coconuts and bananas will fall out. <laughs> and it's true. I had a great uncle, Frank. He used to get drunk as a skunk at every family get-together, and then he'd take out his accordion, and they'd all start singing. Roll out the barrel, and we'll have a... He, he, every time I looked at him, he wiggled his ears at me. It freaked me out when I was a little kid. <laughs> My mother's grandfather was an inventor for Sunbeam Electric about 100 years ago. The family legend is that he was the actual inventor of the electric waffle iron. But his co-workers and his competitors used to take him out to the bar and they used to steal all his trade secrets when his lips were loose. Someone in my mother's family had a castle in Switzerland. This is a picture of it, Hagenville. My aunt went and visited one day. I wanna know who screwed up and lost the castle. Where's the castle? What happened to the castle? And if we shook your family tree too, I'm sure there's some coconuts and bananas up there as well. Your family put the funk in dysfunctional. And mine did too, all our families did. But I have very good news. If you are in Jesus Christ, you have a whole new family tree now. You look up your family tree, you know what you'll find? Faith is up your family tree now. You have good genes now. The DNA of faith is in you. Heroes are in your family tree. Overcomers are in your family tree. Dreamers of big dreams are in your family tree. Tenacious men and women are in your family tree. Courageous men and women. Great leaders are in your family tree. History makers, movers and shakers, wildly successful entrepreneurs, highly gifted people are in your family tree. Great builders are in your family tree. Gifted craftsmen, exceptional athletes. Some of them outran chariots and others of them rode in chariots of fire. Handsome men and beautiful women are in your family tree. Noble people, generals, judges, diplomats, governors, princes, kings are in your family tree. And guess what? Your ancestral home, it's a castle too. But nobody screwed up and lost it. The castle is still there and it's waiting for you. Priests and prophets are in your family tree. Worshippers are in your family tree. Musical geniuses are in your family tree. Intercessors are in your family tree. Abraham and Isaac and Jacob, they're in your family tree. Joseph and Tamar, Moses and Aaron and Miriam, Joshua, Gideon, Deborah, Samuel. Rahab, she's up the tree. Ruth, she's up the tree. David, he's up the tree. Solomon, he's up the tree. Elijah and Elisha, they're up the tree. Don't get them mixed up. Daniel is up the tree, and he's not on his Daniel fast anymore. Esther is up the tree. Listen, when you belong to the household of faith, these are not just characters in a storybook. They are your ancestors by faith. Their true life stories are written for your example. Not only to tell you what great things God has done in history, but to give you an idea of the great things that God intends to do through you. The same DNA of greatness that flowed through them flows through you. Not human genomes, but DNA of the Spirit that comes by faith. You are in the line of the redeemed. You are in the exclusive line of people that belong to the great 
God of the universe. Good news, you belong to a blessed family. What does it mean to be Abraham's seed? You belong to a blessed family. And second, you belong to a blessing family. A family that blesses others. God's promise to Abraham was a family that would be blessed to be a blessing. You see, our call in Christ is to be a conduit of blessing, not a cul-de-sac. First blessing flows to you, and then blessing flows through you. Let me share four things about a blessing family quickly, and then we're going to change gears and we're going to go for a little stroll together outside. Four things about a blessing family. First, a blessing family reconciles all sorts of people to God. God's promise to Abraham was in you all the nations, all the ethne, that's the word from which we get ethnicity, ethnic. And you, all the nations, all the ethne of the earth shall be blessed. Toward the end of Galatians chapter 3, Paul compares the Jewish rite of circumcision with the Christian ordinance of water baptism. We're going to celebrate water baptism this afternoon at 4 o'clock up in Norwalk. We have a couple dozen people that are getting water baptized. And I want to tell you, there's still time for you to get in the queue if you didn't sign up. You can go right back to the church office as soon as this service is over, and we'll get you set up for water baptism. You don't have to pray about whether you should do it. If you're a believer in Christ, Jesus said, just do it. Water baptism is the capstone of the conversion process. It's an act of repentance. It's an act of identification with Jesus Christ. Did you ever wonder why Jesus got water baptized? You know, it's, a, it's, a, it's an act of repentance. Jesus had no sin to repent for, so why did he get water baptized? He got water baptized to identify completely with our humanity before he went to the cross to pay the price for our sins. We get water baptized to identify completely with his divinity and his resurrection life. That's a pretty good trade-off. In the waters of baptism, he identified with our humanity and paid the price for our sins. In the waters of baptism, we identify with his divinity and receive his resurrection life. That's a good trade right there. That's worth getting wet for. Some Jewish Christians had almost persuaded the Gentile believers in Galatia that in order to go to the next level in God, they had to please God by taking on the right of Jewish circumcision. Paul's writing this whole letter that we've been studying to say it's no good. Put your faith in Jesus Christ and get water baptized instead. And here's the thing that makes water baptism better than circumcision. In order to be circumcised, you had to be a Jew or you had to become a Jew and you had to be a male. Didn't work for females. But anyone who believes in Jesus can get water baptized. Paul said, for you are all baptized into Christ. You've clothed yourselves with Christ. There is neither Jew nor Greek. There is neither slave nor free. There is neither male nor female, for you are all one in Christ. Want to hear something funny? Those three distinctions that Paul calls out there are the three things that pious Jewish men thanked God every day that they were not. Lord, I thank you that I am not a Gentile. I thank you that I am not a slave. And I thank you that I am not a woman. That's what they prayed. Race, class, and gender. Those are three things that divide people in every society, everywhere in the world, in every generation. But in the waters of baptism, all such distinctions disappear. 
all the prejudices that are attached to race and class and gender disappear in the waters of baptism. All the resentment, all the hostility that is attached to race, class, and gender. This is really good preaching right here. Ephraim, this is good preaching. I'm going to make myself happy in a minute. That's what makes this family different from any other religious group anywhere in the world. In Christ, we are one. You know, that's one of the things that I love best about Harvest Time Church. There is not another church in Greenwich that is as diverse as our church. Ironically, we're built on the land that the, United, that the government wanted to use to build the United Nations. They planned to develop it into something called Unoville. Can you imagine? It was going to be a model community of harmony to the world. But God had another idea for this land. God had another destiny for this land because there is only one model community of harmony in the world. That's the church of Jesus Christ. That's the family of God. That's the household of faith. Who are we? Look around this room this morning. We are white and we are black. We are Hispanic and we are Pacific Islander. We are Asian. We are Indian. We are West Indian. We are American Indian. We are Jewish. We are Gentile. We are upper class. We are middle class. We are working class. We are male and female. We are all sorts of people. And we're reaching all sorts of people and reconciling them to God. Four quick things about a blessing family. Second, a blessing family is equipped with supernatural gifts for the mission. God equipped Abraham supernaturally for the mission. Abraham was a prophet. Abraham was used in healing ministry. Abraham was used in signs and wonders. Abraham was an anointed intercessor. Abraham had the partnership of angels. And Abraham's children are equipped with the same supernatural gifts for the mission. All through the Old Testament, you can read the story of the heroes of faith that we've already mentioned to you. Abraham's children were supernaturally equipped like Abraham was. And then we come to Jesus, who was the seed of Abraham. And he was the ultimate expression of that giftedness. Jesus was the ultimate prophet. Jesus was the ultimate healer. Jesus was the ultimate wonder worker, the ultimate intercessor, the ultimate partner with angels. By faith, we are now in Christ, the seed of Abraham, so that those supernatural gifts that followed Abraham and all his descendants have become ours too. We have the help of prophecy to bring the blessing of Abraham to all sorts of people. We have the help of healing ministry to bring the blessing of Abraham to all sorts of people. We have the help of signs and wonders, anointed intercession, angelic intervention. I don't know about you. You can choose to believe that that was just a quinky dink, that there was a cross hanging over our property for an hour on Saturday morning, but I choose to believe it was a sign and a wonder to confirm Confirm to us that God is with us. We're blessed with these gifts to be a blessing. Four quick things about a blessing family. Number three, a blessing family multiplies. God promised Abraham that his family would grow and grow and grow. Like the dust of the earth. Like the sand of the sea. Like the stars in the sky, too many to count. God said to Abraham, your family will be a blessing to all nations, to all ethne. And then Jesus, the seed of Abraham, said to us, now you go and make disciples of all nations, of all ethne. It is God's promise and it is Jesus' command that this family keep growing. That this family keep multiplying. That this family keep bringing the blessing of Abraham to all sorts of people. 
That's how I know whenever we pray for phase two that we are praying in agreement with the will of God. Can I tell you, phase two isn't my vision. It's not my dream. It's God's vision. It is God's will. And the reason I know that is because we can't do the multiplying that God promised and that Jesus commanded without it. Four quick things about a blessing family. Last thing is this. Worship team, rescue me, please. <laughs> a blessing family gives joyfully and generously. I want to share a word with you this morning about giving and specifically about the practice of tithing. Tithing means to give the first 10% of your income and your assets to the Lord. The word tithe means a tenth. Offerings to the Lord began in the beginning with the first family. But the practice of tithing began in the Bible with Abraham, 430 years before the law of Moses was given. Abraham had no law that demanded that he tithe, but he did tithe. And his practice of tithing was carried on by his children. You might remember that one night Jacob was running for his life. And he had an encounter with the God of heaven while he was sleeping under the stars. And after that encounter, he made a promise. He said, God, if you'll take care of me. God, if you'll guide me. God, if you'll provide for me. God, if you'll protect me. God, if you'll bring me back to my father's home again. I will give you a tenth of everything that you give me. You know, that's a very easy promise to make when you're a young man sleeping out under the stars with nothing but a rock for a pillow. But it's quite another thing to keep that promise when your assets have grown to quadruple of your rich Uncle Laban. But where do you suppose Jacob got that idea of tithing? I can tell you where he got it. He got it from his father Isaac, who got it from his father Abraham. Abraham's children are givers and they are tithers in particular. One day a very short man with a very fat wallet climbed a tree to see Jesus. When Jesus passed by and called his name, something changed instantly in his heart. And his greedy little heart became a joyful, generous heart. He pledged joyfully to give half of his wealth to help the poor. He didn't have to do that. And he pledged joyfully to repay those that he had cheated along the way four times the amount that he had cheated them out of. He didn't have to do that either. The law only required repayment of the original amount with 20% interest, but instead Zacchaeus chose to repay 400%. That heart inclination to do more than the law required. That heart inclination to go the extra mile is precisely the righteousness of the kingdom that Jesus described in the Sermon on the Mount that surpasses the righteousness of the Pharisees. Zacchaeus, the secular Jew, did what the rich young religious ruler had refused to do only moments earlier. And when Jesus saw that, he said, today, salvation has come to this house, for surely he is a son of Abraham too. Abraham's children instinctively do what Abraham did. What happened under the sycamore tree? Zacchaeus received the blessing of Abraham, justification by faith in Jesus, being justified. He received the spirit of promise, and that spirit of the Son that came into his heart changed his heart and wrote the law of Christ on his heart. And he naturally did what Abraham's children do. He gave joyfully and he gave generously. And Jesus said, yep, he's one of ours. He is a true son of Abraham. This is good preaching right here. Sons of Abraham give joyfully and generously. They tithe. Not 
as a matter of the law, but as a matter of faith. Sons of Abraham tithe because we're thankful for Jesus. We tithe because Jesus has changed our whole life. We tithe because Jesus has brought us the blessing of Abraham, justification, and the beautiful indwelling Holy Spirit. We tithe because we're grateful that God is now our God and He will be our God forever. You know, that's the difference between religion and faith. Religion says you could never do enough to please God. But faith says I could never do enough to thank God. I can't worship him enough. I can't know him enough. I can't honor him enough. I can't give enough. There's too much in my heart. I just don't have the ability to even express it all. That's why Wesley cried out, oh, for a thousand tongues, oh, for a thousand languages to express the praise in my heart to God because this one English language that I have is not cutting it. There aren't enough words to tell God how much I love him. Sons of Abraham tithe because the spiritual blessing attached to the tithe precedes the law, exceeds the law, and succeeds the law. Was tithing in the law? Yes. But tithing was Abraham's practice long before the law. Paul says here that even though the law was added afterwards, it was temporary and it did not nullify what preceded it. Christ has brought an end to the law for us, but the tithe is still blessed, and the promises regarding the tithe are still valid. God's promise still holds true. Bring the whole tithe into the storehouse so that there will be food in my house. Test me and see if I will not open up the windows of heaven and pour out so much blessing on you that you can't even hold it. Tithing is not an exercise of obedience to the law. It's an exercise of faith. It is an act of faith. I'm trusting that the same God that put bread on my table today is going to put bread on my table tomorrow and the next day and next week and next month and next year and in the next decade. And he's going to take care of what I need in the next season of my life. Listen to me. There will be money to send your kids to college. There will be money for weddings and to help them get their first houses. There will be wedding for money for retirement and everything that you need. God has promised it. That's what that line means in the Lord's Prayer. Give us this day our daily bread. Actually, what it literally says is give us today the bread of tomorrow. It's an evening prayer. Prayed at night for work the next day and the ability to earn bread. Sons of Abraham tithe because it's how we partner with God in the work that he cares about most on earth. There are all kinds of noble causes. There are all kinds of good causes. I'm sure that all of them are worthy, but I want to tell you our cause is the greatest cause that ever was. Spreading the blessing of Abraham to all sorts of people. Tithing is how churches are built. Tithing is how churches are sustained. Tithing is how churches grow. Tithing is how missionaries are sent. How shall they believe on Jesus unless they hear? How shall they hear unless someone tells them? How shall they be told unless someone sends them? Who's the someone who sends? It's the church. Just to be very clear, God does not need your money, but harvest time does. If phase two is going to be built, we need your tithe to build it. We need your tithe to sustain it. We need your tithe to maximize it as a tool for spreading the blessing of Abraham. If this is your spiritual home, if this is your family, if this is where you worship Abba, if this is where you get fed the word of God, if this is where your kids get fed, then we need your tithe. And that brings me to the last thing that I want to share with you today, and we're done. This family is part of Abraham's family. And this family needs a bigger house now. 
The master plan for our property was designed in 1998, actually, while Pastor Tate was still with us. We've been chipping away at that master plan incrementally for 17 years. We bought this land. We finished phase one in 2004. We have done as much advanced site work as we can do. There is nothing more incrementally we can do. Now it's time to build phase two. It's time to build phase two because we have completely maxed out phase one. Look around, beloved. Would you just look around in the room? There's just not room for any more people. The halls are impassable downstairs. The Sunday school rooms are overflowing. There's not enough room for our kids. There's not enough room for our teenagers. There's not enough room to meet more people and to lead them into the blessing of Abraham. It's time to build phase two because the zoning approvals that we won in 1999 and we renewed in 2008 will expire at the end of this coming winter unless the foundation for the new building is in the ground. If we forfeit those approvals, they could never be had again. Under the new regulations, the development that we have on the property right now exceeds the maximum limits. And if you look back at last winter, if the coming winter is anything like last winter, we have to start now while the good weather is good well the good weather is with us so in just a moment we're going to change gears and i'm going to ask you to get up how many of you have walked the lines already let me see your hands if you've already wow almost uh, so many of you thank you god bless you we're going to give everybody a chance to walk the lines and in a moment we're going to change gears and we're going to ask you all to go outside and take a lap and prayer walk now this is what you do when you're prayer walking you walk and you actually pray Okay, you move your mouth, you pray to Abba in the name of Jesus. Don't just think warm, fuzzy thoughts. Pray, okay? Pray, Abba, we need you to come with your provision. Abba, we need your help. Abba, we need you to just put everything together. Abba, we need our building permit. Abba, we need a builder. Abba, we need all of the funds to get going. We need $3 million to put in the foundation of the new building, and we need cash right now. So here's what I'm asking everyone to do. I'm asking everyone to give his best or her best right now. Whatever God has put in your hand to give towards phase two, would you give it now? If you can write a $1,000 check, would you write it now? If you can write a $5,000 check, would you write it now? If you can write a $10,000 check, if you can write a $20,000 check, if you can write a $50,000 check, or a hundred thousand or a two hundred and fifty thousand dollar check we've had them before if you can write one of those if you have stock you can transfer it to the church if you have property you can transfer it to the church if you have gold or silver you can give it to the church people have done all of these things before if you have an asset that you can liquidate you can give the money to the church i'm asking you to do as much as you can do the best that you can do right now not as an act of obedience to the law, but as an act of faith, as the son of Abraham that you are. You are the seed of Abraham. You belong to a blessed family. You belong to a blessing family. Right now, this family needs a bigger house, and we're going to pray for that together. Would you stand on your feet, and would you give glory to Jesus Christ, the King of kings, and the Lord of lords? Come on, would you give him glory right now? The God of Abraham is your God. The God of Abraham is with us. Come on, lift up your voice, Savior. Savior, he can move the mountains. My God. You're a blessed family. You're part of a blessing family, and you're a blessing to this family. For our benediction, there's, and this is a miracle. This is like three weeks in a row that, you know, I've ended with like 10, 15 minutes on the clock. I don't know what's happening. Revival must be on the way. This is what I want to ask you to do. Please, please don't just go straight to your car, but I'm going to ask you to find a prayer partner, someone to hold your hand, and walk around the lines, and I want you to pray. Uh, don't just think your prayers. I want you to say your prayers out loud. Pray to Abba. Father, in the name of Jesus, the Son. And would you ask the Father? Listen, God is so good that 
when he wants, he pours out so much blessing that we can't hold it. We have to let it overflow to the work of the kingdom, the work of the church. I want to tell you, we pray for you every Tuesday morning. We pray for promotions. We pray for pay raises. We pray for bonuses. We pray for sales and commissions. We pray that you will get assigned to the best jobs, the best accounts. We pray for every small business owner. We pray again and again and again that God will, we pray for inheritances. We pray for favorable court settlements. We pray for found money. We pray that God will give you grace to buy low and to sell high. We intercede over you. Come on, would you pray a prayer? God, Jesus said, men will rise up and pour into your lap a good measure pressed down shaken together and running over so ask abba we need a we need a builder we need a building permit we need a lot of things we need them right now we need them immediately so i want you to pray now listen everybody look at me because first service didn't do a good job listening and there's there's double the people in this service okay i need you to use three doors to go outside i need you to use this door right here the ushers will come and hold it open for you i need you to use the back back door the back corner and I need you to use the main entrance out of the sanctuary if you're on this side go out this door or that door so that the folks on this side can get out that main door in the back there are baskets by every door if you brought sunglasses you can put your sunglasses if you'd like to put in 10 or 20 bucks or uh, 50 or whatever you have for our medical clinic in Ecuador drop that in on your way out and hold somebody's hand and pray out loud to Abba, the Father, in the name of Jesus, and ask him to help us with phase two. That's going to be our benediction. God bless you, sons and daughters of Abraham. May the God of Abraham be with you this week. The Lord be with you and bless you. Wednesday is Sunday. Come, we're going to pray again, and then we're going to have a great time celebrating, enjoying each other. Bless you.